Hello, and welcome to this session of Metrology Coffee Break from CMM XYZ. Today, we will be talking about the Hexagon Absolute Arm, specifically with the AS1 scanner. Firstly, my colleague Alan will be doing a basic overview of the Absolute Arm, talking about its portability, its ease of use, and its greater protection now with IP54 rating. And then, what Alan will be doing is he'll be doing a deep dive into the AS1 scanner and the impressive technology behind it how it really works. We really wanted to do this to show you the science behind this technology so you can see how it really works to solve your measurement application. And without further notice, I'm gonna hand this over to Alan. However, I will end with this. If you watch this and have any questions, please contact us by visiting our website at www.cmmxyz.com. Thank you very much for your time and we hope you enjoy. Thanks, Alex. Good morning, everyone. We thought we'd change things up a little bit today and start take things out into our measurement lab. Um, today we're talking about the Hexagon Absolute Arm. Let's get started. I just want to run down some of the technology highlights of the arm. First and foremost, the Absolute Arm gets its name from the Absolute Encoders that we're using in each of the axes. The advantage that we have with the Absolute Encoders versus a more traditional incremental positioning encoder is that incremental encoders develop an incremental error the further that you move from the home position. One of the other advantages you get with the absolute encoders over the incremental encoders is that when I power on the system, there's no need to reference the system or home it before measurement. I can just turn it on and start measuring. The arm itself is constructed from carbon fiber tubes. This has been part built into the Romer technology for many, many years, and the hexagon have stuck with it because it's light, it's rigid, and it's thermally stable. Um, the rigidity really helps with the accuracy, given that between the rotary positions here, there's no bending or stretching of the system because the carbon fiber is so rigid. It's also incredibly thermally stable. So we can operate this system up to 45 degrees Celsius. And the latest innovation from Hexagon is adding the IP54 rating to the arm. Now, that kind of begs the question, what is IP54 and why should you want it in your portable system, especially in a shop floor system? So the IP54 rating is actually an ISO IEC standard, which specifies different classifications to provide some more meaningful definitions for when people say something is dust resistant or waterproof. So there are two different classifications here. The first number, the five in this case, is for... Um, solids penetrating or getting inside of the arm, and then the second one is for liquid or water. So the system is able to work in many environments and it can have dust. There will be some small amount of dust ingress into the system, but nothing that would ever cause any damage to the system. And water, believe it or not, I could actually have this arm set up in this room with a sprinkler running and as long as the, it's not actually submerged underwater, the water can splash all over the system without any damage to any of the components. So, for those of you who haven't seen an arm in the past, go over some of the highlights of why you might want a portable arm system. Number one, we have a wide range of tactile probes. We've got a number of lasers and a structured light scanner and there's even now an ultrasonic probe that you can attach to the system and then it covers a wider range of sizes. So you've got from 1.2 meters to 4.5 meter volume. So the wide range of tactile probes, we have shorter fixed styli. We can actually attach a tactile, uh, sorry, a touch trigger probe, or even on the end there, you can see we've got some extended length hook probes. In terms of other uh, optical sensor technology, there are three different lasers the Hexagon offer for this product line. Two of them for the seven axis system, which is the RS5 laser, which is a highly capable red laser. And then we've got the newest absolute scanner AS1, which is a blue light laser, which we're gonna be talking to, about in more depth shortly. Uh, there's also a structured light scanner called the RS squared, which is an area scanner. It's not quite as accurate as the others, but it scans at a much higher rate over a large field of view. So let's talk about some of the highlights of the Absolute Scanner AS1. This is Hexagon's flagship uh, high-speed blue laser scanner, and it has the IP54 rating as well. So this is the only laser from Hexagon that you can actually splash water on or get dirty on the shop floor. You're not going to have any issues with. 
The laser itself is lightweight. It weighs only 400 grams. So the lightweight minimizes user fatigue and ensures accurate, reliable results throughout a shift because the operator is not getting fatigued, and that really is one of the main detractors for accuracy of this type of system. It's high speed. It's actually up measuring up to 300 hertz. That means it's measuring 300 frames or 300 striped lines per second, um, which makes it three times faster than any of the other scanners hexagons put out in the past. We have a high density laser. It's capturing up to a total of 1.2 million points per second. What this actually does, it allows you and enables you to move faster while you're scanning with this system. But more than that, um, it's capturing a lot more data too. So you're getting less missed data and better capturing uh, details around edges and holes, things like that. One of the things, if you've taken a look at specifications from different optical scanning technologies, um, there's a little bit of stackmanship involved. So we have an extra wide mid-range scan line of 150 millimeters. For those of you who work in inches, that's about six inches wide. And that's in the middle of the field of view. So we're not specking out the system based on the widest it can possibly be from the farthest field of view. Right in the middle of the field of view, we've got 150, million, 150 millimeters wide. So it scans large areas faster. And it's a high precision system. So this scanning system accuracy to within 43 microns, depending on the size of arm and the accuracy class that you've selected for the system. Let's talk about the accuracy though. This is truly a volumetric scanning accuracy. So what this test requires us to do is to measure a calibration sphere from five different orientations. So we have vertical and then four horizontals around the outside of a sphere. And then it compares the, the, the center of each of those five spheres must fit within that 46 micron diameter that I just mentioned. This is important because if you're comparing different types of technologies, you need to understand how we're qualifying or how we're spec specifying the accuracy um, of the system. There are some of the other systems on the market that are specced out to VDI VDE 2643 part two. One of the points that I would make here is if you were to try and compare this particular laser on the arm to somebody who specced out their system to the 2643 part two standard, we're actually looking at the accuracy of the sensor, which would be 16 microns, not the 46 we were talking about before. So comparing apples and oranges doesn't really work. So if you're trying to compare different types of technologies, you really need to pick out an accuracy standard that makes sense for the, the, the comparison. So the next thing that I wanted to do is go through a, a simple application of measuring a chrome qualification sphere. I've already got something set up in Polyworks, but pardon me while I switch sides. I'm going to create a new piece in my project in Polyworks. It's ready for me to set up my quick alignment here. So I've got just three points that I wanted to use for this alignment. Software will ask me to prompt it for scanning. So I'm just gonna use the touch screen to switch devices from my probe to my laser. It'll take a second for the laser to start working. So we're ready to start scanning. There we go, and then I will scan. You'll notice I've got LED lights here, and if I go closer to the part, or if I move away from the part that I'm trying to scan, you notice these change color. When it changes that nice cut green color, you know I'm right in the middle of my field of view. One thing you should take note of is the stem that's holding the ball is a matte black color. And then we've got a shiny chrome spear that we're scanning. And the software is capturing really excellent quality data on both of these within the same stripe. Make sure I've captured the entire sphere. So having finished that, I will move to the next step. I just want to take a look. So 
The calculated diameter for the sphere is 25.4, and we are within 7 microns of the calculated diameter. But I wanted to go back into the PowerPoints presentation and kind of talk about how Hexagon Shine technology works for allowing us to scan such difficult materials with such ease. So the real magic behind the AS1 scanner is this um, highly advanced algorithm Hexagon have put together, which they've entitled Systematic High Intelligence Noise Elimination, or the acronym for that is SHINE. So what does it actually do and how does uh, applying a math algorithm help us get better scan data? So what it does is it automatically controls the exposure settings on the laser. And it not only does this for a, a, a single exposure for every point that it measures, but it's actually able to do multiple sampling at different exposures to ensure you're constantly getting the best value for each point. So this isn't across the stripe either. This is literally across each point. And that's how we're able to get very different surface textures and qualities, uh, high gloss versus a matte surface, all in one scan. So we can digitize pretty much any surface, things that used to be a, a real issue in the past, glossy black plastic, molded carbon fiber components, all without uh, anti-glare spray. The, the idea that they named a good scanner after noise elimination kind of begs the question to what is noise, scan, noise in scan data anyway? So there's always a random variation in the calculated points created by the scanner. If you have a lot of noise in a scan, what you'll experience or what you'll notice in the scan data is that it kind of appears rough, have like a rough or bumpy texture, kind of like an orange peel. Um, that's what we would kind of typically call noisy data. And one of the things that's interesting is noise is always present within any scan. So there's always some kind of random variation in the image. Uh, digital cameras convert photons, which is light energy, into electrons, which is electrical energy, and then amplify the electrons to create voltage. That's a mouthful. But really what the, the point there is this, it, uh, this process has a lot of noise built into it, but under ideal conditions, it's not, uh, it, you still end up with a, a nice uh, smooth scan surface. So what factors impact how much noise you might see in a scan? When you increase the laser intensity to capture dark surfaces, um, or you use longer exposure times, especially for that, and then when this is also a highly reflective surface, all of these contribute to noise. So one of the things that I think a lot of us, the people who train you or sell you laser scanners are guilty of, is giving too simple an explanation for how a laser scanner actually works. So what we'll say is a laser uh, line is projected onto a surface out of the laser emitter, and then that line reflects onto a camera which takes a picture of it. Now with this particular camera, it's taking 300 pictures per second. And if you take a look at the image on the right of your screen, you'll see that the way we describe this would lead you to believe that you would end up with some razor sharp um, scan data just across the screen. This isn't really what happens. When you reflect, when you shine a laser onto a surface, especially if it's a nice low, low gloss matte surface, um, you get what they call a diffuse reflection, which means the laser light is not reflecting directly back up into the camera. It's actually dispersed in many directions. And the image on the pixel array is actually, um, you get this kind of very smooth kind of transition from the brightest point in the middle out to a lighter area um, into the darkness or whatever. But the point is there's a lot of light hitting that camera sensor. So the software has to do something to figure out what points it would actually return for those to be um, the, the scan data. Really what happens, and we've got this theoretically perfect scan here. Um, if I was to take just one of those vertical columns of points and I was to plot the intensity of each light or the amount of light that was picked up by each pixel, you'd get this really beautiful looking normal histogram. Now in the real world, that's not what happens because there's ambient light conditions, there are differences in the, uh, the surface technology and then the cameras themselves also add some kind of um, errors into that measurement. So what you really end up with is something that looks a bit more like this. So it's kind of a fuzzy image. Instead of getting that perfect image there, what you would get is this, but you can still see that histogram looks very nice. Um, but figuring out where the actual scan data was, you'd have to do a bit more math to ensure that from one scan picture to the next scan picture, you're getting roughly or almost the same um, return point values. So 
when we scan a high gloss surface, what actually happens is when the, the, the light hits the surface, instead of scattering into a bunch of different directions, it reflects directly off in another direction. So whatever direction the camera's viewing it from, it gets completely overloaded with the uh, scan data, or not scan data, but uh, light data. And you, the camera, we, the, <laughs> normally what we'll say is that we don't see anything or no points were returned. The fact is way too many points were returned and it was impossible to figure out what the brightest part of that, uh, uh, that scanned image was because the whole thing's too bright. So this is where the shine algorithm comes in. So the shine algorithm has the ability to adjust the brightness of the laser on the fly using multiple sampling. It also has the ability to increase the gain. So if you've got too much light hitting the camera, then you wanna make that uh, kind, of, kind of counterintuitively, but if you make it more sensitive to the amount of light that's hitting it, um, then you can reduce the brightness of the laser and it starts to capture the image a little bit better. Furthermore, though, if I was to take a hit look at that histogram, you'll start to see that not all surfaces look so great. And you get this kind of bimodal image here. So then they use further algorithms, uh, further processing in the algorithm to get rid of the noise, to get rid of the secondary reflections, and to try and return a more repeatable um, return point for each point in that uh, scale. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to do today then was a real world type demonstration on a sheet metal demonstration part that we have in here using the absolute arm with an AS1 laser and I'm going to be doing this inside Polyworks today. My laser's all set up, so I just want to launch that inside Polyworks. To capture the scan data on the part, because this is a thin sheet metal part, I do want to use the boundary points acquisition as well as the surface points acquisition. The advantage of this is that I get very nicely defined surface features, surfaces as well as holes um, and the edges of the part as well. When I project the laser onto the part, you'll notice I have a blue laser stripe as well as a red rectangle, which uh, signifies or denotes the field of view of the laser. So anywhere within the blue stripe inside that red rectangle. I'm going to be able to capture the data, and then you can see the further away I get from the part, the field of view increases uh, significantly. I've also got an LED light on the back of the arm here, or the back of the laser, which also is used as a cue to know where I am within my field of view. So I'm just going to pull the trigger here, take my first pass. scanning at 300 hertz which means we are getting 300 stripes per second and up to 1.2 million points per second so we're getting very dense data and that's one thing I should point out I find that if you've got a really good laser line scanner with a high point density you can actually get the software Polyworks to generate an incredibly repeatable and incredibly good um, boundary point scan for defining those trim edges and uh, features for extraction. The analogy we use in training for how to start scanning is really, it is very much like painting a wall. So I'll take large broad strokes first and then fill in the missing data or fill in the missing areas as I go along. I do apologize for getting in front of the camera here. pretty good. Now I'm just being fussy, probably scanning a little too much. But just this one section here, I thought we'd take another pass. Make sure we've got good coverage on the entire part. Bear with me, I'm just going to change to a full screen view of Polyworks. I don't think you need to be looking at the back of my head while I do the rest of the demonstration. Okay, so I'm just going to end the scan. 
finalize the mesh. I've already imported the point cloud for this part, or is it the CAD file for this part. Sorry about that. So I'll just bring that back. And step number one, I did manage to skin the table a little bit here. So I'm just going to erase that. Close that utility. If you haven't seen Polyworks before, we've done a few demonstrations where we've used it. I don't want to get too deep into how to use the software, some functions that I've used, I've gone over in some of the other webinars that we've done. Um, if you're interested, sure, uh, hit us up for some training. I'm going to open up the best fit data to reference objects alignment. I'm going to use the automatic alignment tool, and I'll just start that. And sometimes it doesn't work, so we're going to undo that. And we'll use the point pairs instead. Split my screen. Pick a couple points to give it an initial guess of how these two things should fit. So I got the cat on the left side, measured part on the right side. There we go. So I had mentioned, I'm going to hide the cat for a second. So I had mentioned the boundary and edge points. So the boundary points are all of these green data points all the way around the trim edges of the part, around the hole. What I like about these is because we've got such a high resolution scanner, it does a great job of putting a nice sharp edge at the end of the feature. Typically to measure a circle to get accurate results or repeatable results, we need to get data inside the hole. Um, but in this case, we don't need that because we've got all of the edges of the part defined nicely. We wanted to take a look at the quality of that scan data. It's beautifully nice and smooth. Um, just looks great. All right, so let's extract some features. So I'm going to hide the scan data for a second. I'm going to Open up my Create Features dialog and just extract a couple of features. So there's a circle there, there, round slot here, there's a hole there, and then there's another one on this side of the part. If you haven't seen a scanning inspection in the past, um, you're going to be pretty blown away that I can just scan the part in a couple seconds, go to the properties to make sure that we're set up to extract these features. Looks good. Right click extract the measured values. Just wanted to change one setting here. I don't want to be measuring off the surface data. I actually wanted to measure all of these features off the boundary data. And there we go. And now we have already created an inspection report for a few of the features on the part. The next step that we want to go into this with this type of inspection is always going to be a color map. So we'll add in a color map. There you go, and then there's a number of different ways that we can modify the color map in terms of the color scale on this part. If I modify that here, we'll use plus or minus one millimeter, and you'll find that this part's actually not very good, but that's useful information. So, and then if I wanted to start adding something into an inspection report, say, I could take a picture of that part. It'll start the initial inspection report. I will hide the color map, restore the features, pick a view where I can see all of them. And bring back the label for this circle here. There we go. That looks good. I'll take a picture of that. If I wanted a more traditional looking CMM pro, uh, inspection report, I can select all of those features. Switch over to the geometry controls. Define maybe some GDNT for these if I wanted to. I have the ability to add in feature control frames. I'm not going to do that right now. Report. Add in a table. So if we take a look at our inspection report, There you go. 
Didn't want to delve too deep into it, but here's kind of a, a very simple inspection workflow from start to finish. And then the final step, if we were in a production environment and we were taking a number of measurements on multiple pieces, then I'm going to re-execute this project. I'll just store it, give it a place to save it, push create, and now it'll ask me to start scanning. So I know my laser's already set for scanning, and then I could start scanning piece number two. Polaris does a really nice job of defining what the critical path would be. So it knows all of the things that need to be done, or all of the features that I've created, all of the operations that I've performed. It was keeping track of this. You don't normally see this, although you can turn open, open a window or open a, a menu where I can take control of that if I thought I had a better idea of how I wanted the program to operate but it remembers all the things that I did in the order that I did them and is able to, pat, uh, to walk me through repeating that inspection. my second sample measured. I will pull this utility out of the way. Go to the next step. So it'll finalize the mesh. Ask me to repeat the point pair's initial alignment. notice I don't need to be very cautious or careful about the way I do that and there we go now the second part has been completed and the inspection report ready to go all right and that completes the live demonstration for today over to Alex and that concludes this session of metrology coffee break we hope you learned a lot about the absolute arm the AS1 and the impressive technology behind. If you have any further questions, wish to book a demonstration, or wish to know more about the Absolute Arm, please contact us at our website, cmmxyz.com, or give us a call, 1-800-606-9266. We thank you very much for your time, and we'll see you at the next coffee break.